Should we build a more amoral society? In this conversation, I speak with the professor of philosophy, Hans Georg Müller, about the role that morality plays as a potent social engineering tool for establishing order and power. We discuss how morally charged language is often divisive and rigid and leaves little room for mediation. Georg argues for the benefits of a more amoral society and points to humor as an antidote to morality. This is one of my favorite conversations I've had on the podcast yet, because I was initially pretty confused about the topic, and so you can watch in real time as my understanding of Georg's position develops. I highly recommend listening until the end of the conversation, as Georg paints one of the clearest images I've seen yet, as morality as a kind of communicational dopamine, which allows us to see ourselves as heroes for our own actions, while painting those who disagree with us, not just as being wrong, but as being evil. I'm Shane Farnsworth, and this is the Escape Sapiens podcast. These conversations are supported by the Andrew von Braun Foundation. If you enjoy what I'm doing and find these conversations valuable, then the best way you can help me out is by subscribing, liking, and sharing the content. And now, I'm pleased to bring you Hans-Georg Müller. I hope you enjoy. Escape Sapiens. Georg, welcome on the podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So today, uh, the ultimate goal is I want to get a better understanding for what it means for someone to be moral, right? In, in our usual naive conception, someone who's moral is someone who conforms to some standards of what's good and what's evil. But there's also the flip side, right? You, you, can, you can have a moral system that becomes rigid and, and starts producing uh, sort of destructive activities, you know, ethnic cleansing, political purges, religious war, these sorts of things. And so I, I want to get a better idea for that side of the coin and also whether you have any recommendations or antidotes to this sort of destructive behavior. So that's the that's sort of the end direction I want to go to. But I thought I'd start somewhere a little bit more basic just to get an idea of how you view mora- morality. So sort of what is morality and is there any sense in which we have some sort of a universal good or evil or is it really something that's really just locally determined by external circumstances or who holds power at the time? Right. Yeah, I think that's a very important question. And uh, I actually kind of fundamentally disagree with kind of the common sense approach to morality, which is also strongly influential uh, in philosophy, moral philosophy and ethics on uh, what morality actually is. Um, My thinking on morality has two major sources. Uh, if I may answer the question somewhat long windingly. Uh, number one is, uh, is Taoism. So that's the early Chinese philosophy of Taoism, which not only me, but many interpreters read as uh, very critical towards morality already. So we have an ancient philosophy that's already very critical of morality. So that, that's, since I studied Taoism, since many decades that has a strong impact on me. That's my, my professional background, uh, Chinese philosophy. But then but my second major theoretical background in philosophy is Nicholas Luhmann's systems theory. So here we get to very contemporary social theory. And for different reasons, but with surprisingly similar effects, Nicholas Luhmann is also very critical of morality. And he's very explicit about something that I think you also find already in early Taoism, and namely the idea, to go back what I said at the beginning, that our common understanding of morality is somewhat uh, wrong, uh, because uh, for them, and especially for Luhmann, uh, morality is a, is a type of communication. It's a way of how we talk and of course also then uh, that's influenced by it uh, how we think about something Uh, but that it's basically a form of communication by the way you find similar ideas also in um, Nietzsche and also in Wittgenstein who also were both very critical of morality in different ways so uh, what does this mean well basically traditionally or still like a common sense conception of morality things that they're basically either like morality is a quality of a person, right? So mm-hmm. that's what, you know, we think that's the, like the, we think someone is very good or someone is evil, right? Or uh, we think morality is the quality of an action, that it's somehow, you know, that we can somehow measure actions, particularly utilitarianism, right? 
uh, that's very, you know, looking at political measures or again, like individual actions and then um, thinking that somehow morality is the quality of an action. And then when we get to German philosophy, kind of the modernization, especially to Kant, who has been very influential for mainstream moral for Western philosophy today or global philosophy, the idea is that morality is the quality of a principle of a maxim, right? And somehow this then leads to the idea, which is still very uh, influential, uh, that we actually need, that was in, in the wake of Kant, that was a major philosophical idea in the 19th, 19th century, that we can have a moral science, right? And that's it, it comes explicitly from Kant. And, you know, Kant famously, it's actually on his tombstone, you know, he said he was in awe of two things. The, the, uh, when he looked at the stars and, you know, the law, the natural law above us and the moral law within us. And he meant this very seriously, right? He thought that it is the task of philosophy, one of the major tasks of philosophy, is to normatively determine the moral laws uh, that are, have the same validity and that have the same actually also kind of yeah, same validity and also they're kind of have no don't tolerate exceptions like natural laws and so that's really so that's still still a very dominant dominant idea in philosophy and in ethics that so to speak the task of philosophy is to find out these moral laws uh, moral principles that are good right and if we if we have once we found out the, the, the good moral principles, then we will do the right thing. So these are kind of three common conceptions of what morality is. Uh, and I think they're all wrong. And I think they're quite obviously all wrong. Uh, so I side with and again, that's not something that I, that I claim is like hugely original. Uh, as I said, many others, including Luhmann and Daos, have said very similar things before that as a matter of fact, morality is a way of, is basically a form of judgment expressed in language and that then takes on root in whole, let's say, sort of uh, cultural practices and so forth. So it's a social practice of judging certain things. And um, if you still want to give me a little, even more time to answer this question, I might just give an example. Sure. Um, that... Um, I see one of the, um, I watch a lot of these crime shows, these um, documentaries about real true crime, right? And then uh, there are a lot of them on the internet, uh, which is actually quite good. And uh, I like those that are also um, where we're like, that, that put a lot of emphasis on the actual court case, mm -hmm. uh, on the on the trial, right? And and then you see, especially in America, but I think it's coming back also in Europe, is this emphasis when they, when they, uh, you know, when they, on 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 the how evil the perpetrator is, right? Mm -hmm. That's always like uh, uh, that's that's something that is especially in the in the um, American legal procedure still very strong that they that you produce like moral outrage, mm -hmm. and one case where it's most of course evident is with regard to pedophiles. Which is now like the most evil crime in in our society, usually regarded as that. And so I think that's a very good example, right? To 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 see how how this works. That of course then these these pedophiles, and we have this kind of almost visceral reaction to that, right? Even I, even though I'm critical of it because it's a culture I also grew up with, that we regard these people as thoroughly evil. Uh, and um, that's kind of a very immediate feeling. But if you think about it, I think, it for, again, for particularly from a scientific perspective, it makes much more sense to look at it psychologically, right? To look at even like, you know, biologically there, you know, um, uh, there are of course, very often uh, these um, pedophiles have themselves been abuse that's a very common uh, feature so th obviously there's something wrong with them and obviously uh, i'm also in favor of you know somehow restraining them putting them to jail maybe for for life but if you want to you know analyze what's wrong with these people it's not that they have an evil soul 
I don't think a soul exists, right? They're, what's wrong with them can be much better described and but much more precisely described, and I think should be much more much more precisely described, also in order to find out what the best way is to deal with them. Mm -hmm. If we leave the the moral impulse uh, and the moral kind of communication that that goes along with this uh, impulse, if we if we how to say if we um, um, suspend that and uh, actually look at the more whatever, again, psychological, sociological, biological facts that all contribute to pedophilia, right? If you write an, an, an academic, a scientific article about pedophilia, and then in the end, just, that is all about proving the evilness, that, that's not <laughs> science, right? That's not, not something that you can, uh, that's, that's, that's a way of, 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 of judgment, how, how, uh, how we look at this. And so I think that's a very good example to to explain like the major point that I don't think, you know, and of course it has a in the Western tradition, right? It has this this it's very strongly this idea that that people are evil is connected to this idea of the soul, mm -hmm. uh, which I also think is I don't think we have a soul, right? And um, so in this sense, I think morality is not really if you reflect on it, a personal quality, it's not a quality of human beings that, so what, what would be, where, where would this evilness, what, what would it be a property of, right? Are your hormones evil or, you know, if there is no soul, what, what's the, what's the, what's the agent who, who is evil? That's, uh, that's very basically impossible to, it makes no sense if you, uh, you know, um, as I said, you can't really write an academic article about this. And then similarly with the action, right? Because um, um, if you, you know, whatever, determine the effects of an action, then you can find out all these effects. And, and actually Wittgenstein said very similar things, right? You, you can, of course, describe the actions and, and all the negative effects that an action has. But it's very difficult to say then this is kind of... Um, evil right this is this is what really makes an action evil it, it brings up this and this and this and this and this if, uh, whatever consequence that an action has or th these effects that are produced but and then we can say for very good reasons we don't want these effects and therefore we don't want the action but evil is not really any form of, of precise quality of an action and similarly uh, i think it's uh, that kant was obviously wrong that moral laws don't exist. There is simply no such thing as a moral law that has the same kind of validity in a normative sense that um, that natural laws have in a descriptive sense. And they've been like totally elusive, right? I mean, uh, and why are they elusive? Because, um, and that's another thing, you know, that brings us it's a, to um, commun morality as a phenomenon of communication. Morality basically immediately leads, as in moral philosophy, uh, it leads to dissent, right? And uh, if, if you make like a moral proposition and so forth, you uh, thereby, that's already again what Taoism basically, the early texts already say this, right? You create a moral language and the moral language is basically the condition for its own negation. Whenever you say this is good, and then basically you cr you create the the condition. Nietzsche said the same thing that you you set up a discourse that whose basically semantic structure is one of um, dissent. Mm -hmm. So the idea, the idea that uh, within this kind of communicative structure, uh, which is something that Kant thought and that then in the tradition also Habermas and so forth and many current moral philosophers think that you know if we make the just if we only get it right then eventually we will have a consensus on the moral law and i think that's that's uh, that's a complete misunderstanding of how moral language of how moral language functions because in itself it creates and it operates basically uh by providing linguistic and therefore also intellectual opportunities for dissent. And that's what has happened in the whole history of morality and the whole history of 
more language, just like religion and so forth. It also, uh, you know, uh, uh, you have a religion that immediately splits up in all these different sects and, and beliefs, and, and and something very similar happens in on a secular level with with moral communication. A very long answer. <laughs> but would would you say that that breakup is sort of uh, evident in some sense that there isn't a universal or that you shouldn't be approaching morality in sort of utilitarian uh, way? If if I go back, so if I go back to your example of the pedophiles, if if I if I go ahead and I I, I make some if if I have some moral system or some belief about what moral morality's what morality is that's wrong. Is is the downside just that I make it, that my triage process breaks down in terms of criminal cases, or are there other inconsistencies that are also obvious? You know, if 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 I assume, for example, let, let's make the assumption that I can scientifically prove that something is absolutely moral, or I can show that something is absolutely good. What what is what are, what are some of the inconsistencies, and what is it sort of the ridiculous things that might pop out of that original set of axioms? Well, again, I don't think, I mean, we have no no evidence that uh, the, the evidence points to, to, to the contrary, right? I mean, there is no such thing as a moral science in the sense as we have. I mean, you have a scientific background, right? It just, uh, there is nothing, I, I think, that, that points to, uh, that allows the assumption that kind of moral qualities are, um, you know, uh, objects of scientific research mm -hmm. so uh, you, like, you don't uh, adhere instance, to so, sorry for interrupting so sort of the sam harris no, no, approach um it, to morality where you can have some objective scientific um grounding on you know this is good because it reduces suffering you, you'd say exactly no i i agree with sam harris like 80 percent i think we can very well have a science uh, about well-being, right? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's basically his point. I'm just saying that's not morality, right? That that's the why does he call this morality? He calls it morality because that kind of ennobles his whole project. That's kind of the the mystical language that he at the end adds to it. I have a whole video on this, right? There's a Chinese saying, you know. Uh, uh, drawing a snake and then adding the feet, and uh, which a snake has no feet. So I think in this sense, we can definitely have a science of, of well-being, both regarding individual well-being and even some sort of social well-being, right? I, I, I agree with Harris 100%, but I fundamentally disagree with him uh, that in this way, we address the question, that, that, which is the moral question of, of good and evil. Mm -hmm. I don't think... Uh, that this is uh, that this is the same. Okay, so he's making a connection that may not be stable uh, there. The, so, so let me, you know, in my conception, the way I imagine things is, I imagine originally we started off in small groups, and there were certain individuals in that group that had certain priorities. Let's say they had a lot of, um, they themselves owned a lot of things, so maybe they wanted people not to steal, and so that was their, you know, prerogative. How, how do you get from someone with power initially saying, you know, this is the way that we should act as a tribe to, to later on down the line, some generations down the line to people really believing it and sort of it's sort of like um, uh, it's sort of like moral Stockholm syndrome or something like this, where people really, truly believe in moral as a moral thing that I shouldn't steal. You know, whereas maybe originally it started off as just like a, a statement of power from some small set of individuals. How, how does that, I don't know if I've been clear here, but do, do you understand how that process uh, develops? Again, if you look, no, I mean, obviously, but I think like the notion of stealing too is very um, uh, problematic, right? There are many kind of right-wing people in the US who think that taxes is a form of stealing and that it's therefore completely immoral. It's a very common attitude in North America, right? That, uh, and, and actually the whole Republican Party is basically uh, um, working on this kind of moral proposition. And again, that's what I would say. It just depends on how you define stealing. Uh, and then 
uh, you can build up a lot of moral outrage on this, and then you can have, uh, you know, you can have, a, you can have, you can build a whole kind of ideology and a politics, and and create some form of, of, um, of social, uh, in this case, uh, a political or a religious organization, even mm -hmm. around it. Um, so, if you moralize that's what typically happens because moral language is very powerful right mm -hmm. it, it it within it it helps a, a religious group a religious association to um build up you know power in in a society nowadays it's used in politics it's used in media to attract attention so if i call something as stealing then uh, that and and I succeed with this. Uh, then I that that kind of increases my own kind of moral uh, power in a society. Um, now, I'm not sure if that directly addresses your question. Of course, I think that stealing that it is necessary in a society that it um, regulates property. Right, mm -hmm. in order for it to function. Now, how to from from a uh, from a communist perspective, from a Marxist perspective, um, property should basically be public. A lot, most of private property they would regard as somehow being stolen, actually, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, again, we have the, it's the opposite position of the of the of the right wing American people who think everything that's not private property and every every sort of property that becomes public property is somehow stolen. So again, you see, you, you use you use a moral, um, you use a moralization of property ownership, and moralize it and that creates certain, you know, uh, potentials, political potentials and so forth. Now, of course, it is necessary for a society to organize and regulate property ownership. Mm -hmm. And I simply think that the advanced way of doing this is law, mm -hmm. right? Where we have certain laws and basically in the law, through these laws, we also say basically neither private property is evil nor public property is evil. We kind of demoralize this very issue of property ownership, so it's a, it's it's instead of a of a of a of a moral way, which kind of somehow says this is stealing and this is not stealing, it makes a distinction between what is stealing and what is not stealing in a moral way. I think it's much more effective uh, if it's being done as advanced societies do it. Mm -hmm to do to, to uh, treat deal with this in a highly complex society uh, with a uh, law mm -hmm. right? I, I, and that's I, much better than whatever like because in the past that's the example you refer to it was mostly like in religious context it was like highly moralized and then people who stole they get their hand cut off or something like this right well this the thing the thing I was trying to get to is it's kind of strange right the People will follow some moral uh, laws or some moral direction, which is to their detriment, and that they sort of do it willingly. And I, 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 I there's many examples that you could give, but I, I kind of want to understand, you know, to start with, when you, when you have a small tribe, say, with just a few people, it's it's yeah. really direct. You know, the what the consequences that come from any behavior, it's very direct because you just in, you interact with you know ten or twenty people who are in your immediate vicinity. But morality is much more abstract than that, right? So if I if if I've stolen, I've I've taken even the things I've stolen might be abstract, like money, for example. Um, I mean, still again, uh, what Shane? I'm trying to get it that stealing is like something. It's like a totally socially constructed category that hmm. becomes meaningful because it is so morally charged, but it has very actual. Uh, a content right if whatever um you know how you organize property ownership 
that always follow certain principles. And then whatever violates this principle is called stealing. That's totally arbitrary. It's mm -hmm. totally arbitrary, mm -hmm. right? You can make the point, and Marx has made this point, when at the time when uh, private property concentration in very few individuals' hands through a, through a development of individualization and modernization of society that became somehow economically very effective, and no one called that stealing, right? Mm -hmm. Because there was a social environment that focused on uh, individual individualism. But if you compare this to earlier forms of economic arrangements where whatever, like Native American societies, there was no land ownership, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you can basically, you can have a very good point to say that, that, that you say, I own this piece of land is already, if you have a different setup that regulates land ownership, then that's stealing <laughs> because you 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 claim that's what it's actually where claim you know you claim that's what they did the americans right they came to uh, the the settlers right they came to the coin they claimed this land right that's what it ever claimed and then if you violate that claim then you're stealing from them so i want to get to so you mentioned moving away from a moral based system to a legal based system and i want to get there eventually but i thought uh you so, also mentioned sorry if i uh, sorry shane for interrupt the point that i'm making is you have a certain economic system that mm -hmm. functions according to a certain rationality and rather than you know straightforward trying to analyze these rational the rationality behind it and explain it why that makes sense in this society in order to defend it in order to in german say durchsetzen in order to 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 uh, uh, how to say to justify it and to make sure it it's this way you use a moral language mm -hmm. it's the same thing that marx said so the whole language of stealing is a moral language that is used to justify and to durchsetzen, to to socially, um, what's a, you know, German, what, what's a good English word for this? Durchsetzen, um, to put through? I, I actually don't know the word. So that you, um, you, you have this system and to, 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 ju to justify it, to make everyone adopt it without questioning it, mm -hmm. you, um, you uh, basically invent a certain moral system according to which then something is designated as stealing as opposed to something else which is not designated as stealing and then you don't do it in primitive societies you use moral and religious language you say that's against god's will if or that's evil and i think that's that's uh, uh that's much less effective than on a let's say more rational basis uh, dealing with property relationships in uh, in a legal way so that you that you don't e actually really need this kind of moral um the, the the moral foundation for 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 this but so so that's interesting because I, I i this is getting to sort of one thing that i want to understand which is sort of the the usefulness or, or the function of uh, morality so you know before talking about sort of the, where things can go wrong and going to sort of legal descriptions of, of um, how we do things, you know, what is it that a moral system allows you to do at, at its core? You know, it, 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 does it reduce um, the, the, the need for empathy in thinking about other people? Does it uh, stand in place of, uh, you know, can it replace violence? You know, I, I don't have to always send my police out to correct some behavior because people will intuitively you know follow a lot you know what 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 is the what is the benefit that um, morality really gives us before we talk about the problems well again um on the basis of my understanding morality is first and foremost a form of communicating and then also a form of thinking so what's the benefit of this as i already said it allows society to do a lot of things, for instance, to justify, and I still don't know the best word for doing sets, and to establish, to establish and justify, for instance, a certain economic system of ownership, right? And we say this is good, and we mean it in a moral sense. Why do we organize ownership of property in a specific way? 
you need to justify it and to be able to make it, let's say, accepted by everyone. And one relatively primitive way, but very important way to do this is through moral language. That's why mm -hmm. it's good, because it's effective. It does the job, right, for justifying mm -hmm. and establishing a specific way, for instance, or what is very important econo in, for an economy, a functioning economy, that you establish certain rules of ownership. So that's mm -hmm. why it's good. That's why it's so important. And on top of that, uh, as, for instance, it did uh, with religion, but today we see it in politics or in the media, it provides a lot of opportunities for whatever social selections, right? We, we, we become a voter of this party because we think whatever, Trump is evil or Biden is evil, right? And even though the policies don't really, not that different, right? But uh, we, um, uh, uh, we, it's, it's a very powerful tool that allows as a social tool and as a mental tool allows to, for instance, uh, a certain organization or a certain person to build up power and to become very prestigious. So it's an extremely powerful social tool. That's it's maybe the most powerful social tool that we have. That's why it's so good and so effective, but of course, in a non-moral sense, good and effective. It's a tool. It's a, it's a super. It's a super efficient, maybe the most efficient uh, social tool we have for, for instance, establishing order, establishing power. This might be a bit of a silly question, but why is it that morality is so effective? You know, why don't we? Why don't we have the same sort of emotional upwelling with like beauty and other judgments of those sorts? You know, why, why, why is you know could we re if for for instance if we replaced morality with you know beauty, let's say, would we become as emotional about that then? Or um, I'm I mean, you could ask the same question, which I often do ask myself, and I don't have an answer to your question. I think it's a very good question. Can I ask the same questions about religion? Typically, morality was very, very closely tied to religion. Now that we, at least partly, part of our modern societies have become greatly secularized, but some haven't, like the United States are still very religious, right? Uh, but Europe, uh, I'm not sure, Australia, probably less religious than, than the US, right? So we see yeah. their... Um, um, which is, I think, a, a, a relatively new thing that we have a, um, a separation of religious communication and moral communication. Prior to this, basically, the two were almost indistinguishably mixed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so, the, the, um, so what was exactly the question? Well, you know, I... I'm I'm interested in um, you know where moral authority is derived from, uh, whether it comes from yeah, violence yeah, yeah. and sort of thing. Yeah, and so where does it come from? I don't know. It's similarly like where does it where does the belief in God come from? Right. So so now we we made basically a progress that we no longer necessarily believe in in God, but we still believe in morality. We still believe in this distinction between good and evil, which in the Christian distinction is basically the distinction between God and the devil. And we no longer talk about God and the devil. We talk about good and evil. But it's basically uh, where does it I, I think that's where it comes from very clearly. Uh, and, and maybe we can answer the question why, because somehow at a certain point in time, the whole religious narrative became too, became no longer, unten became untenable, right, with the rise of science and, and it became obvious that there is no God for most people and that there is no devil. But at least we retain this, this kind of um, belief in good and evil. We kind of, that's a, that's a secularization process. That's where it comes from quite obviously in of course it's not so do you think then do you think so we already have we already talk about separation of church and state so your antidote to the destructive side which we haven't talked about yet uh yeah. of, of morality your antidote would be sort of a separation of morality and state is that 
the direction you would drive down? No, my direction is very simply just minimize moral language and moral thinking. Again, I can I gave all, you already a, at least indirectly an example with regard to the pedophile. I think it's better for everyone, better in the sense that Harris uses the term better, that it's better for well-being if we are, and, and for Harris, I think doesn't make this step, if not we become more moral, we become less moral, then we increase our well-being, right? And uh, again, like I think it's for it's better for social well-being. For instance, if we treat pedophilia through legal means, through psychological means, so uh, therapeutic means, also through putting people in jail, for, uh, perhaps even you know killing them if necessary, but not for moral reasons, uh, and uh, not with a more not with a and uh, I, I, other examples I like to give, um, I usually give like two or three examples to make this clear. Like uh, one thing that I, I experienced in my own life uh, uh, was uh, divorce law. Mm-hmm. How uh, that has happened in my life that uh, when I was a kid, uh, divorce was still a super evil thing. And you always had to find, even in the legal proceedings, I watched this, that is my, 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 uh, love for crime shows as like as a as a young teenager there was like this um german tv series documentary as well about uh, court cases uh, divorce cases just like regular tv program and at that time the law was still to find out who of the two spouses is guilty it had that was the whole point you had to find out who's guilty and this person then doesn't get the children it doesn't get the money Right. That was the old mm. law. And then that must have been in like 1970s, 80s, that that was changed. And people said, why mm. it not, makes no sense. Right. We'll just somehow distribute the money and everything fairly. And we just don't ask if, who's who's guilty. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. So we see. And I think that's that's much better. To, and nowadays, of course, you know, at that time, it was a big I don't know, you're too young maybe to remember this, that was a big social stigma. Oh, they're divorced. Oh, she was guilty. Now we don't think in these terms anymore. Well, that's, yeah, I think that's I'm a, a bit that, too young for that one. Yeah, and, and for you it's strange, but I, I remember this very, very clearly, the, that, that divorce was basically, uh, was totally moralized. It was like mm-hmm. the the whole approach to divorce was 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 moral, and we've overcome that, and I think that's great, and uh, I think that's just, and that's what we we could do similar things, for instance, with regard to pedophiles as well, and I think that would be also good for everyone, and would probably uh, be a better way of dealing with the problem that pedophilia is. Hmm. So, so in other words, if you well, so one of the benefits of reducing morality in the system or its impact in the system is that then you can uh, base your, for example, criminal judgments on something that can where you can be more objective and scientific. So you can you can yeah, base your judgment and and it's and that's a second thing. Now I'm I mean also a video about this now like with war, right? Mm-hmm. What now with the Ukraine war, right? And Every war, of course, it's it's comes with a war is highly moralized. Mm-hmm. Now that so the Russians are evil, and of course, from the Russian side, the Ukrainians are super evil, right? And um, so every war is is extremely morally charged, and that's why it's very difficult to go back from war to peace, because you somehow. Uh, have to you know there, there is no neutral ground the, the 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 place for mediation basically disappears because in order to have effective mediator the mediator basically is again in order to be good at mediator you have to not look at the war in moral terms you have to try to find a solution that both sides can somehow live with that is somehow workable and that will end the suffering of the war but in order to do this you basically have to suspend your moral thinking and the, and the more total of wars, the more the whole world is, and everyone is supposed to take sides, the more difficult it will be 
uh, to uh, to go back uh, to peace. Or if you go back to peace, then if it's still morally charged, you will demand the total destruction of the opponent, right? Which then is already the seed for the next war, as we had very often in the past. Uh, you know, and uh, that that uh, okay, we totally destroy the other side, but then more hatred and moral resentment will grow, and that's already the seed for the next conflict. So again, I think for, in order to 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 move from war to peace and to have something like a, um, a workable peace, again the the suspension of moral communication and moral thinking is is essential. And of course, it's very difficult. So this is, so let's say you wanted to reduce morality in a system. I, I immediately see a problem because it's very useful. Like you say, like if you if if you want your young men to go die in that trench over exactly. there for your, uh, there's there's no reason why someone in power where the moral system is currently in line with their interests, for example, would want to give that up uh, readily. Exactly. And they they might exactly. even not be able to rationalize giving up because they really do see it as something that's good. Right. right. And also <laughs> so, because so you, they actually don't think moral morality is communication. They actually think the other people are evil. So so then so I so I'm starting I'm starting to see see how your view works. But so, so how how would you so, so what would your prescription be? You know, if if you wanted to incrementally to move towards a world where people really do see this as a communication, where you, you know, how how would you go about doing that? Is there is it possible, or do we all have to become moral philosophers? You know, <laughs> um, well, no. That's again, Taoism and Buddhism have basically cultivated a morality since many many centuries. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, in Buddhism, you have the same thing, you know, don't think in terms of good and evil. It's kind of a mental discipline that, that you can that you can practice. Uh, and um, it's a kind of a therapeutic thing, a very good tool that is also very powerful that society has developed to counter morality, which is necessary for survival, is humor. Mm -hmm. Humor okay. is humor is 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 something when you start laughing about yourself, laughing about others, laughing about like, you know, about religious people, it, it uh, right? And, and humor is, I think, one of the most important functions of humor is kind of a kind of a mental hygiene that suspends moral thinking and moral communication and soothes it. Right? You can have that sometimes you you have a fight, whatever, with your spouse or with your friends, and then after a while you just start laughing, right? And every it's such a cathartic thing because you were in this and then then it all is kind of it all goes away. That's a, that's an almost a Zen Buddhist enlightenment moment. And, and that's very central. Again, Buddhism and Taoism are very simple. Bo Buddhism is more well known than Taoism, but basically Zen Buddhism is for development of Taoism and Zen Buddhism is an amalgamation of Indian Buddhism and Chinese Taoism. But anyways, so that, and that's an important tool, for instance, in Zen Buddhist practice is, is this kind of is this kind of laughter, this kind of therapeutic um, relaxation. Mm -hmm. So, I, the, yeah, but so that's I, because that's an alternative to the intellectual thing because that was your question do you only have to do it through philosophy no culture has has developed uh, for instance humor as an as an antidote to morality can i ask you know i i'm actually quite ignorant when it comes to eastern philosophy and i i i, I do actually have quite a few questions about you know how it differs uh, from Western philosophy and and why that's important uh, if you want to build, for example, a Western political system. You know, why did, for example, uh, democracy in Afghanistan w w not work? But you sort of made me curious about... Um, so, obviously, there's still war in cultures where Buddhism is the major religion. So... so obviously, so, yes. So what's the... I, I'm, not, I'm not throwing in any objection. I'm, I'm, I, how, do you, how do you pass... That is it. Just that the 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 amoral system isn't complete there, or or you know what what's the link there? Why why is it that in in non-Western systems you still can have 
let, let's call it moral outrage that leads to people dying in the trenches. Yes, absolutely. I'm not saying that the East is more peaceful or less violent than the West. Uh, I'm not saying this. It's just one, let's say, cultural resource and that mm -hmm. I'm more familiar with because that's where I'm trained in. But if I was more trained in the Western side, then I would come up with something Western. I'm not saying the Easterners are more peaceful and less moralistic. It just happens to be that that's uh, my one of my backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not saying that and, and I'm, I'm not saying whatever that you as I said, like humor is a universal thing. And it's it's cultivated in different ways. But I think humor has also served very strongly in the West uh, as an antidote against morality. So, so then how much weight should we give to moral outrage, for example, because, you know, often um, <laughs> moral outrage is accompanied with people stiffening up about their humor. Um, yes. You know, if, if someone claims that they're, they're morally outraged, should we give them the podium? Like, is that is, you know, I, I, because I want to talk about the ways of implementing a more amoral system. And yeah. this is one example where um, you might want to develop some sort of an approach. Um, I'm how you very, deal, very example, skeptical outrage. about moral outrage and about righteous anger. Uh, this, I'm, I think that's super, very slippery slope. And I don't think this should be encouraged at all. I think that's very dangerous for both for individuals and societies because it's so closely related to violence and to psycho and sociopathology. Again, I would argue again, 80% with Sam Harris. I think you can probably, you know, uh, find, prove that somehow with, uh, with the, whatever the science that he refers to all the time. He's so, also strongly so, influenced by Buddhism, by the way. Mm-hmm. The, the <laughs> actually, I, I, I've, I used to listen to quite a, a bit of it. It's been a while since I've listened to uh, what he has to say, but um, I, I, I generally like uh, what he has to say. So yes, I do. Um, I do too. So the, then let, let's let's finally get to. We've sort of been tippy toeing around the destruction, the destructive side of. We're saying that sort of it exists, but haven't really sort of dived in. So, so how is it that um, moral systems become rigid? Sort of, you know, under what circumstances do they become rigid and, and lead to sort of destructive behavior? And uh, where does the pathology arise? What, what does the other side of the coin actually look like? Well, again, the, the, the thing about morality is, as you just already pointed out uh, with your uh, reference to moral outrage and so forth, that it is um, closely related empirically to violence. You mentioned earlier, you know, basically the best way of making people kill others, which again, there's lots of, also Harris refers to research and they said they normally don't do this. People mm -hmm. normally don't do this. So the tool, the communicational and mental psychological tool to make one group go out and kill the others is, is more communication, is more outrage. Um, so that's why it's bad. So it's not a system that is in itself bad. That's what you said. I don't think one moral system is kind of worse than the other. It's the intensity. It's the intensity mm -hmm. with which it, with which it's, uh, you know, the fundamentalism that it leads to. That's and that any any system I can can you know now we have our whatever the whole wokeism thing becomes more and more fundamentalist right and that's the, the the it's not the content it's the you know and all these ideas are initially great you know christian is all about love and then you go out and kill others because you love them so much and of course you know uh, whatever um, um now the wokeism is all about social justice and and then uh, about freedom and uh, then uh, you start you know canceling everyone and uh, become all you know uh, uh, ever more fundamentalist in your uh, uh, in your thinking and acting and become ever more obnoxious person and um, so that that's really it's not the, not the content it's really the intensity um, both in Luhmann, who I referred to earlier, and in Taoism, you have a similar metaphor for um, moral communication and morality, namely uh, compared to whatever bacteria that Luhmann uses, right? So we all have bacteria in our body and, and we need them, but uh, 
you have to keep them in check, right? If they if they become uh, to take over the whole system, take over the whole body, then uh, then you're in danger. And and somewhat similar, I think, is is more communication. It's, it's unimaginable for us not to communicate and think morally. Um, but uh, really, it be, can become an infection. That's the metaphor. Mm-hmm. Right, it can become an infection, and just like, and then, then things get out can get very easily out of hand. So, apart from apart from the uh, sort of work culture, or, or even drilling deeper into what you mean by this, what are sort of the pathologies that you that you think are currently? Uh, what's the, what's the current infection uh, look like? Is it just work culture, or is there more? Well, I think that's the most well. Of course, you know the most, the worst thing is now the war that we have, um, and um, we have this hatred building up. What in America has been called the culture war, which is of course, uh, the war in Ukraine is of course connected with the culture war, right? Uh, there is a connection, and in the West it is kind of framed. Yes, could I, could I ask you? So, what is? Could you more fill out that uh, what you're saying there? So, what's the connection there? Well, I mean, um, the, the war is bo- on both sides is framed as somewhat similar to the culture war is framed that um, the West argues, you know, the Russians are and the Russian is, is a threat to our way of life. And that means like the liberal progressive LGBTQ rights, right? You you read this in the newspapers, right? We In Ukraine, we are fighting for the LGBTQ rights or so. You, you, you hear such things. Yeah. Uh, and um, of course, in, in Russia, it's the other way around, right? They, they come and then, uh, you know, all these, uh, they, they threaten our traditional family values and they want to destroy our, our you know, the, our good people. They, these evil people out there, these liberal Westerners, these LGBTQ people, they, they will, uh, you know, um, they, they are evil and threaten our moral goodness. So it's, it's, it is connected. Uh, because that's the kind of the moral discourse that that's so dominant in, in our society. So you see that um, um, very strongly. I think this whole um, culture war is 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 a, is very strongly moralized, and that's why I like to call it civil religion uh, because it has different from the as I experienced like earlier political um movements this is even more so it's difficult to say exactly but i think it's even more so like kind of a, a religious uh, these po- 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 like vocism has religious features because it is uh, so highly moralized mm-hmm. yeah what why do you think it is that so, so i see morality as being a really effective tool to mobilize people. You know, yes. that enemy over there, they they eat their eggs from the wrong direction or whatever it is, right? Right. So why is it... If you look at big problems like climate change, for instance, right? why doesn't it seem that we're able to find... Okay, so you, your position is to reduce morality, but why? Why yes. is it if, if if you had another view, which is let's use morality as a tool, and and use it to really, um, you know, this is a problem that we see in our society. We can we can develop some morality that unifies people, so we're in lockstep and you know addressing climate change or going to Mars or whatever right. your interest is. Yes, what, it's a good why, example. And again, what? it's the same same thing, Shane. Well, could, um, could I just ask? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I just fin- go ahead. Finish the. Sorry. I, I, yeah. The, I want to know why it is that why do we develop you know outrage around the things that we do and why it isn't there why can't we choose the sorts of moral systems that <laughs> you know why can't we build one that actually gets us to work you know towards climate like it seems that we don't have control over uh the outrage let's say the the tools seem to not function in the direction you want they're sort of <laughs> Well, again, uh, because moral language is divisive, it's it's and moral communication is 
is that's its essence. It's a distinction between good and evil. Once you moralize the discourse about climate change, everyone who doesn't agree with you is not just wrong, they're evil. And the other way then adopts it, of course, it's mirrors. It's, in, it's, 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 it's a, right? So that makes the whole discourse about, it doesn't help the discourse about climate change. I, I think that's a big, big, big mistake, right? If you, it's the whole media discourse, the whole political discourse says, we, let's, yes, we must make climate change a moral issue and this will help. It doesn't help. It has the opposite effect in that it becomes totally socially divisive. And by telling the other people who, you know, might have different views that they are actually not just wrong, but evil, you, you, you make what, what could have maybe become a more or less rational discourse about climate change and turn it into a moral culture. War. Mm, I see. So yes, basically, moral uh, communication is divisive. That's the answer. It's by definition divisive. And you, you always create the bad with the good, I suppose. Like, it's just by yes. construction, you're going to... Okay, okay. So so then... <laughs> so why You can't is it be then? good if the others aren't bad, aren't evil. Right. Well, I was, I was hoping that you would be able... You know, I, I knew that there wasn't going to be an answer like this, but I, I was hoping there was going to be an answer like, oh, climate, you know, the... You know, the some concept out there is bad, not the way that these people are behaving. I guess I had sort of a naive hope that you'd be able to construct a morality that doesn't have the, the flip side, let's say. But, you know, let, 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 let me ask then, you know, if... So it seems obvious when you say it that, that there is this flip side. It seems obvious that you're going to be generating division, um, just sort of you know, from first principles, more or less. So why, if, if this is the case, then why is it that in society, we, there's so pr much prestige uh, for morality? Like, why, why do we associate morality with the good side? And, you know, why is a moral person good? <laughs> Rather than, uh, you know, yeah, where does the prestige come from? And, and, and actually further, it's not just prestige, but we allow sort of... Um, moral theater, right? <laughs> you know, we have Jerry Springer sit up there, um, you know, d doing ludicrous things on, on television. We, we have, we, we allow people to have their moral outrage. You know, where does this, why do we allow this prestige? Why do we allow morality to have this power if, if it really has well, this Well, it's like a science? drug, right? It has similar function to a drug. Let's go back to the example we use, like killing, right? Normally you would feel totally shitty if you killed someone, but with morality, you can become like a hero. And that is basically true, like with everything, right? Uh, normally, you feel shitty, or whatever, if you beat your children. But if you have the 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 right morality, then you are like a good father who is just, you know, doing the right thing and can can feel great about it. So um, it's uh, it it has this um, it it helps this self assurance, self righteousness. Um, thing about it and it's like a kind of um communicational dopamine that makes you feel good about yourself and some people might argue that that's not not a not a bug but a feature i mean in the sense that you know you might need to um let's say for example there's a difficult decision you have to make difficult in the ethical sense but nevertheless taking this decision will in the long run end up minimizing suffering let's say then then maybe um maybe one of the benefits of this morality is that it's uh, mentally protective when you do those shitty things uh, that, or do you do you think that that sort of benefit is it sounds like you think that benefit is really outweighed by the fact that it also allows you to go shoot those other people or not necessarily that i answered this way because of your question um because mm -hmm. you were simply asking why and one of the reasons mm -hmm why why do we like it so much even though it has bad effects that's how i understood your question and then my answer was even though it has bad effects uh, it gives us the feeling that we're doing the right thing but of course you're right it also generally i mean it's nice that we feel good about ourselves right and um we do also a lot of things we that were actually that are actually probably good things and then with morality we we feel good about yes i agree with you 
I agree with so, you. And that's why it's so difficult to get rid of it. So, so do you, in, in situations where we really should get rid of it, uh, perhaps like in criminal cases, do, do, you, do, you think, do you think it's possible to have a fair criminal case once morality, you know, outrage has been triggered? Like, for example, uh, for a recent example, um, um, it was uh, uh, who it was Floyd Floyd. Uh, who was the um, African American who was um, George killed? Floyd? But, uh, yeah, yeah, and and so um, Derek Chauvin, he just had his trial, right? right do, do you right, think it's right. possible in those circumstances? Um, do you think it's possible in those circumstances to have a fair trial where the entire wor- world has been watching and, and sort of geared into the? No, no, it's not really possible. Of course not. I mean, so the guy be becomes d- a symbol for evil, right? And the other guy becomes a symbol for the innocent victim. And there is nothing you can, if you challenge that, because the, it's so highly morally charged, even people like listening to what I just said, simply because I let's say, they will probably already think that I'm a little bit evil <laughs> because uh, I'm just uh, somewhat critically retreating and saying that this is what, what has happened. Uh, but I think it's an obvious fact that that this has happened. And now everyone sees it in these very strong moral terms. So if you just take a step back and just describe that fact, then you're already kind of, um, in German we say a little bit of a Spielverderber, uh, someone who um, um, ruins the game. So, so do you think, you know, usually you have, a, you, you have the jury, which is a jury of your peers. Do you reckon we should remove the peers part of that? You know, should we have um, a jury that's composed of people from different countries who may not share the same moral system? Or what, what's the, is there, a, is there an obvious antidote that you've already thought about there? Or how do you, how, I, or should I you just always, wait some time? Yeah, I always very skeptical about the jury system. Uh, I, I don't really like but it's spectacular it makes for a good drama uh but yeah because you have to and this is especially in these high uh, uh, highly charged cases like murder cases that i watch um then that's very different from european law where you don't have in many cases a jury you sometimes do but uh, much less and because you see how much the well, both the prosecutor and the defense morally uh, appeal morally to the jury and 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 appeal to the to the moral feelings of the juries that's like it takes is like 80 percent of the case because that's that's where you get the jury it's a psychological social social psycho social 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 psychological um mechanism that takes over the actual legal thing a lot hmm so, so think, in other words, uh, I think a trained. I think we need trained judges who minimize their moral, uh, their their moral framing of of legal cases. I think that would be great, but it's unlikely. And given, I guess, the connection between religion and morality, I suppose you really want to separate any reference to the Bible or any religion. Absolutely, um, yes. By construction, otherwise, uh, yes. It, it, this is going to sound, but had <laughs> okay the. the so, so how do, how do you determine then what's fair and what's is it just based on it's just based on um, minimize, minimization of suffering or do we do we want to have vengeance in our built into our system uh, because that does make people feel good right it, where would you draw the line on on uh, these sort of uh, issues? Well, again, I'm that's a good question and uh, I'm cannot probably uh, answer it. Uh, Completely. Um, I mean, you have to find out again, you can probably like Sam Harris, uh, try to get, you know, empirical input, right? Um, Find out, you know, what what more scientifically prove what is actually conducive to well being and what is not. And you can also, I guess, implement this somehow in into legal procedures. But again, you have to find um, I, I, what I use in my book, the the the, the moral fool. I, I use the example of sports, basically, uh, where we also where we have the notion of fairness, uh, right? And um, 
Um, mm. The notion of fairness is basically um, just uh, to make sure that the game can be played and that everyone's fine with it and likes playing the game. Uh, and <laughs> I think law should uh, somehow be uh, some somewhat similar oriented to some form of um, a, a functional fairness. I think mm -hmm. that's uh, that's something that law could maybe learn from how you organize regulations in sports because law is about basically ensuring that certain regulations are um, you know uh, mm -hmm. are in place and that they are uh, as uh, um, as Luhmann says, law is about, the main function of law is to stabilize expectations, right? So that's the function of law, that, that uh, whatever, traffic law, right? Function traffic law, you, it's amazing that traffic functions so way right? because we all have the same expectations that everyone drives on the same side of the road, right? Uh, and and, and that, that's, we can expect it and do expect it. And that allows us to drive at amazing speeds down road with other people driving with the same amazing speed, just like very close next to us, right? And it, it works very, very well because we're, mm -hmm. we're managing to, and that's that, like, that's a function of law to stabilize expectations. And the same thing basically in sport where you also find these regulations that then stabilize the expectations and then you can play the game. And then uh, that's also amazing if, you know, I like watching sports, like what, what then becomes possible. Uh, and I think we should approach law somewhat similar that on the basis of, of fairness, we find regulations that stabilize expectations. And then like in sports or in traffic, uh, people um, more or less voluntarily um, uh, agree. And then of course, if we have violations then whatever, you get expelled, you get a red card or you get a ticket or something like this, of course you need that. And that's, that's absolutely mm -hmm. necessary for stabilizing expectations. But again, Isn't... also in, in sports, sorry, we don't moralize normally uh, mm -hmm. the person who gets a red card. Not yeah. overly. A little bit is fine, but it's not overly. It's, it's minimized. Even though we still get emotional. I th yes. <laughs> I, th I think... I think um... You know, one of the... Okay, so, so one of the questions I immediately have then is, you know... You know it's true that we have rules-based systems in, in order to make <laughs> sports work. But then again, you also have basketball and soccer and whatever different sports you have, and they all have their own, you know, systems of, of rules. Right. Whereas when you have a government, you've got a government. You know, you don't, you don't have – I guess there are different countries and, and maybe there are different states in, in America, but – you know the the people who are six foot seven may really like basketball, whereas right. so I, I guess you see where I'm going with this. You yes. know, is it yes. is it is is the limitation that with a single government you're just not going to make enough people happy, and then you're going to jump back into this thing where people are arguing on a moral level and sloganeering. Is it sort of is it is it possible out, outside of small nations, or do we have to just break down into smaller nations or What's your view? No, there? I mean, I mean that's totally true, and that you know, um, the tall people will play basketball, and whatever the uh, nerdish and smart people, they play chess or whatever, right? And um, so, th I mean, that's a good thing that you can have. You have like lots of different games and lots of different sports, and and that's why I use fairness because it's not just. Right. It's not it's not just like uh, basketball, as you said, like is extremely unjust towards uh, people who are very short. And chess is extremely unjust to people who are whatever, not very clever at calculating or stuff like this. But it's fair. Yeah. And then uh, you can do other things. Right. The, the short people can whatever. For instance, there are many positions in soccer where actually short people like Messi have a very significant advantage over tall people. So there are sports mm -hmm. also major sports where short people are advantaged over tall people. And so that's great. Mm -hmm. But if you would have a sport which would be aimed at 
giving exactly the same to everyone else, that would be a horrible sport. <laughs> First of all, it, we were, it's impossible. And secondly, it, uh, it would probably not be very much fun. But see, that's 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 where my question is. So where you say it's impossible, how do you, how do you port across to a governmental system? You know, do you is your if if you were going to put this into practice, is your idea, for example, that the the different sports would correspond to different, you know, career paths, or uh, you know, um, right. where where is the because uh, obviously you need to give everyone a path through life where they can succeed, and I guess any rules-based system that you're developing, it's going to be difficult <laughs> at well, I mean, a governmental that's, that's level. That's a thing that, that's also, I guess, pretty good about today's society, which is highly differentiated. So we have a lot, lots of different professions where people with different talents, what you should do is, I think, I'm still a little bit of a leftist Marxist, I think some professions are unfair because whatever, the people who labor with their hands still make much less money than people who, whatever, uh, you know, are in advertising, designing mm -hmm. advertising campaigns. That's not so nice. But uh, nevertheless, um, you know, um, you have... Uh, like the you have like all these different areas uh where which wasn't really the case in in previous societies where uh there was much less how to say flexibility right if you were born like as a farmer you and whatever and especially as as a woman uh, you you had basically no opportunities or you could just do what was already prescribed and and um i think our society has progressed a lot and that's not necessarily and this is also something but that would be a different topic i don't think government can really steer society and even has the function to do that i mean society develops evolves becomes more complex and there are lots of factors political factors included uh, but also economic factors technological factors generally how social society evolves becomes more and more complex and um yeah, so, um, and then to go back to, so I don't think we need an overarching morality or we need even an overarching political ideology that claims to be like the central um, steering knot for it. I see. Right. This so is the past, like in the past, it was religion, right? Religion was supposed to, to, determine everything in society but that's not not really necessary so more of a sort of a libertarian bent towards politics then i'm i'm not really even saying that i think society it's, it's this is influenced from luhmann from social systems theory this is basically luhmann's point that social society so society is not normative he's descriptive Modern society, contemporary society that we live in, consists, he calls it functional differentiation of all these different function systems, economy, politics, media, science, and many more. And none of them is actually in control of the others. They're like different systems of the body. And so I think it's an illusion that whatever the government is actually in control or can be in control of society or should be in control of society but not in the sense as the libertarians say it i think uh, it makes a lot of sense if the government uh, whatever uh, um, like you have in, in in european countries where you know where where uh, we have higher actually u.s taxes are still pretty high but because they spend everything on the military but we have lots of like public funding from medical or for education or i think that makes a lot of sense so i think it makes a lot of sense that the government says whatever we need to make sure that education is publicly funded or we need to make sure that that um, medicine is publicly funded and that everyone has to pay uh, a certain uh, um, whatever and like in germany for instance i think it's good that homeschooling isn't allowed which is for americans uh, something very terrible right they think they think that this fringes on liberty and so forth so i'm not saying that this or that policy should be that i'm not advocating a libertarian policy 
I'm just saying, even if you have like ever like a political system regulating education it, to a certain extent, that doesn't mean that it that that it is at the center of society because whatever the media also have a lot of power mm -hmm. that they exert on society. The economy has a lot of power. The legal system has a lot of power. All of them have a lot of power, and they they mutually kind of. Um, they mutually um, influence one another. And I mm -hmm. think that's, so that's have... what, what already society is already set up like this. Okay, so you have like um, parallel power structures and in a certain sense, these uh, provide the different games, let's say. Right, <laughs> yes, um, I, I, exactly. I want, to step, I want to step back a little bit, um, back to just morality in sort of a yes. fundamental sense. And exactly. Just, just ask. How is it that moral systems change? You know, we've talked but about again, uh, how they become. So morality is not really a system. To go back to what we just said, like morality becomes dangerous if any of these systems is overly infected with morality, right? If politi mm -hmm. politics becomes hypermoralized, it's bad. If media becomes hypermoralized, if the law becomes hypermoralized. But back to this, you were asked. To the question you you said so I don't want like talk about moral systems I think systems are like politics media economy mm -hmm. and and they can all apply to greater or less extent moral communication and if they get hyper more they get infected then it becomes problematic any of these systems mm -hmm. now um, your question was how does morality change right yes yeah, so, so to give you like to to sort of give you a concrete example to work with or just to sort of better uh, point towards what I mean. You know, for example, so one thing I'm curious about is, for example, you know, was it the case that we started seeing slavery as being evil because we now sit on the right side of history and we became more moral and good people or whatever that means? Or is it that, uh, for instance, technology and the, the circumstances surrounding slavery changed and made it net less economically viable. You know, you know, my question is, does technology, you know, precede evolutionary change or do, does, uh, yeah, how do these changes happen on sort of a society uh, wide level? Yeah, again, sorry, I have for this, I have a theory, a whole theory of this. So, uh, <laughs> um, you're allowed long uh, answers. I, I, yeah. um, like that's a recent book I wrote with Paul Ambrosio about you and your profile, Identity After Authenticity. So I, I think um, there, that if you look back, this is what we call a regime of sincerity in traditional societies. Um, people very much oriented, defined their identity by orienting themselves to certain roles, right? These roles, and that had a, that also was tied into the morality. So whatever, women had certain roles in the family, and then you know there was the idea that you know of the of the um, whatever the, the the chaste woman and the the devoted uh, religious person and whatever and the 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 warrior who is very courageous. So uh, all the kind of the moral system was tied to this kind of identification and orientation to social roles. Um, and this then changes in modernity. And this has also to do with, a, because a slave system makes sense in a traditional role-oriented society, right? Where also um, in ancient Greece, there was already slavery, and that was part of the morality there, because it, it everything was kind of the morality was tied to this role orientation, and slaves had a certain role in society, was, which was inferior to other roles, just like female roles were inferior to male roles, and so forth. And then in modernity, and because of technological changes, because of social changes, like very dramatic social changes in the economy, right? But as you said, also technology and society changes. And then we have this shift to what you could call individualism. Uh, but we call it like authenticity. And then along with this come all these, come, comes this new set of values 
focus as basically individual focus. And then slavery makes no longer sense, right? Everyone is, as in the American constitution, right? We are all like these free individuals. And then they notice eventually, well, we kind of forgot about the slaves, right? They, uh, they, they are also, um, right, uh, individuals. And then because it no longer fit, the, 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 mm-hmm. basically the whole slave ethos was an old sincerity role related ethos that once a society switched to this kind of individualism, uh, then it makes no longer sense, right? And, and so you have this whole new regime of authenticity where it's about individuality, about originality, about creativity, about uniqueness and so forth, right? liberty individual liberty liberty is now the individual in liberty of the individual so so th- there's this whole shift towards um towards this new way of how people uh, build up a sense of identity right you're no longer identity primarily through an orientation to your role but now you somehow are supposed to find your true self and then somehow mm-hmm. that's the that's how how you how you how you build a sense of of identity and now i think that's what the recent book is about we we actually are saying this is changing and we're changing towards a profile oriented identity where we project profiles not only but also on social media and that's a whole different thing and probably morality is also going to change according to that but it hasn't really changed yet we're still very much in this in this um in, in the west right in the west the the dominating moral values are values that are tied into the individualism authenticity way of constructing a sense of selfhood so this is interesting because i was gonna my next question was going to be something along the lines of um you know why is it that um it seems so you know we very quickly went from a society that um was very oppressive towards, for example, homosexuals. And then in you know, almost the blink of an eye in, in terms of how old, how long cultures uh, stay around for, that completely flipped. And so my next question was going to be something along the lines is how, how can these, you know, very quick shifts happen? But I guess you sort of answered the question already, which is that there was this underlying change that may have happened much earlier and over a longer period of time, which was, a, you know, a shift towards this individual uh, value exactly. system and, and so okay so I, I I'm kind of I was blind to that and looking at sort of the maybe the fruits of, of that change that may have yes. happened um, and, and along with it comes the breakdown of the family right for if you have like a divorce rate from over 50 percent of over 50 percent and so forth and you know which only only fits into how society functions today right then um then this kind of fixation on one man, one woman for a lifetime uh, just doesn't fit the social reality. And because, again, also you no longer identify. No one really mm-hmm. identify with, as, as people did not that long ago. My grandmother is still the generation, right? Which was very much still the ethos of sincerity that you strongly identify that this is not just, and that's, that's why it's also so deeply anchored. You identify with your role as wife and with your role as mother, and um, you you build this very strong sense of selfhood in orientation to your role. And that, if you have that, and that becomes socially dominant because it's tied to the family structure, then of course homosexuality is a scandal because there are no roles mm-hmm. for homosexuals, right? And uh, and um, once this this all changes and the the role orientation no longer you don't identify on the basis of of your family role, uh, then why not? What's wrong with homosexuality? It's just fine. It makes you even more unique. Makes you more special. Contributes to your authenticity. I, I'm curious about sort of the uh, mental impact of of morality. I was about to say moral systems uh, of, of morality on you know. So so the. A question I have is back when women had less options in terms of their careers, let's say. Yes. If you had gone back then and you'd asked a, a woman, you know, in 1880 or whatever, is the system that you currently exist in fair? You know, is it morally right that your husband goes to work and you stay at home and look after the kids? Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious w- what you think her answer would be. 
And similarly, you know, if you asked someone who was homosexual, for example, uh, is the is your attraction to the same sex is that morally wrong? Is it sinful? You know, you know uh, what sort of mental damage did such a person? It doesn't have to be with homosexual. It could be with any other along any other axis. Is there sort of mental damage that's associated with with that? Or you know, so I want to I want to understand the way that people actually thought in these other moral systems um, that we now see as being antiquated. Well, I mean, a lot of uh, people, and still like in China, Russia, in the Islamic world. Uh, they still very much hold on to the traditional family, like the woman in 1880 that, that you brought up, right? Maybe in Europe, that many of the women in 1880 would probably have insisted that, you know, would have had, would have moral enthusiasm for their role. Mm -hmm. Even though, of course, from when we change, from when we look at it from today, from their perspective, then, then we think, uh, no, they're kind of completely wrong. They're morally wrong. But again, so is there a right I, side I, of history? No, I don't. I think we shouldn't really, as I said earlier, it doesn't really help very much. We can diagnose this, as I just did, right? We can understand how people think morally and how that, again, helps to establish certain social structures. That's the function of I think it's better to kind of, as I said earlier, to minimize the moral framing of this. And then we can just, whatever, understand better why a pedophile is pedoph has pedophilia. I think we can have better explanations for this than moral explanations. And we can have better explanations for why it's we have a lot of people practicing homosexuality today being homosexual uh, than in earlier societies and we don't necessarily it's, it's not that we are more moral people were very moral in the 19th century we're not more moral than them hmm. and it, it doesn't help to be more moral hmm. so Moral progress is sort of like a red herring somehow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so this is okay. This is a little bit tangential. But what what do you think we should do with uh, statues, for example, that people? Okay, you, you think we should let, be? Let me. Sorry, I want to go back. I want to make a, a, a um, sure a, a, a sc a scandalous statement. I don't think homosexuality is morally good or. I don't think I think we shouldn't think about sexuality in moral terms. Mm -hmm. I don't think right. That's that's I think it's also good for not just for homosexuals, but for any sexual <laughs> all of sexuality, if it's not so much seen in moral terms. So the the. Um... Uh, of course, then you, you have to uh, incentivate some legal system for things which are damaging, like pedophilia, for example. Or, but yeah, course, I, I, I think exactly. I tend to agree yes. with you. Yeah. I think I tend to agree with you. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually don't think that's so scandalous. I think that's, um, I think that's the way that we should go, at least along those lines as well. Yeah. But um, so, so, so let me ask you the tangential question then. So what should we do? So people still are moralistic, <laughs> whether you think it's yes. the correct way to go or not. And so what should happen with the statues? What should happen, you know, um, when when the population is morally outraged about something? Should, yes. What what we should happen to... As I said earlier, one, one, we should make uh, use of the resources of comedians that we have. Mm -hmm. Comedians are very are, are sometimes our only saviors from religion and from moral outrage and from, like whatever David Chappelle or so, right? That's 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 how society cures uh, its its wokeism. Also today, the the dangers of wokeism. I'm not saying wokeism is worse than it just only gets worse when it's when it's morally infected. And that's why we need people like David Chappelle. You know David Chappelle? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've yeah. seen him live. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's what we need. That's great. That's that has a very strong cathartic effect. It's one of the best resources we have. 
I want to get back to you. So I, w- I want to um, sort of wrap up the discussion looking forward towards the future. And I want to bounce off something you just said before, which is that you have a prediction for the way that our uh, morality is going to drift now in the West. Um, are you able to sort of flesh out uh, your prediction a little bit more? Well, the idea is that there's now this shift from authenticity to what we call profilicity. That's branding. You basically build an identity like you build a brand. And we all need to do this. You and I do this on social media as well, right? We both have our channels and that's how we build a profile. We need to build a profile as well as a philosopher and so forth. And um, But we don't really have really, and I think that is the future morality which I don't know yet what it, uh, what it will exactly be, uh, because I, st- I think it's, it's still lagging behind. Um, but I think there will be a morality, the future morality will be a morality that will support the profile-oriented identity, just as the individualism authenticity morality supports the individuality oriented identity and the traditional moralities support the role oriented identity. I think the future morality will support the profile oriented identity, but we haven't really figured it out yet. And I don't know what it will be. Can can I ask, when you say profile oriented, do you mean things like I belong to X class? Uh, Is that specifically what you mean? Yeah, it means people. that mm, it means that we are like look like the individual like the individual is, is supposed to be this you're supposed to be this unique one person and you're basically uh, are it with regard to another person who is also authentic and you know them well. Now the profile is very different. Like you and I, we haven't really met. Nevertheless, we have uh, this uh, discussion here over two hours now, and it's both basically in the service of building our profiles. Uh, and when we have different profiles in different contexts, and the profiles constantly change, so uh, we are much more kind of trying out different things at the same time. It's not really that we have this kind of core unique self that um, that we that we are kind of in in a small circle of friends, but we're projecting ourselves to large audience who we don't even know. Uh, and we're we're projecting as out into a future, and we are um, we are very much concerned with reactions to us by an audience that we don't know, right? I guess you'll also be you know whatever checking the uh, the the views that you get and stuff like this. These are all, and then we develop a sense of we 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 are invested in this profile and we build a sense of identity by our investment in in this profile and it gets validated not Mm -hmm. so much through other individuals which is sent like in the role gets validated by the other role players right your role as mother gets validated by your kids and your partner and your role as authentic individual gets validated by other authentic individuals your soulmate but the profile gets validated by um, a kind of an acclaim, an attention, a a kind mm. of um, uh, a kind of uh, being noticed by by people who you don't know, by having a certain standing, by having a certain assessment, right? By having a certain rating and ranking. Ratings and rankings become so important, right? Like a brand, and um, everything is now also in academia, right? Whatever the university where you are. It didn't matter like 20 years ago in Germany, all the universities were the same. Now it's your, your identity as an academic, very much your profile depends on which university you're employed with. Same thing, where do you publish your paper? No one would cared about this in academia 20, 30 years ago. Now this all becomes super important. It's like kind of this profile building of the journal, of the university, of the individual who as an academic. And it's sim- similar to what we as YouTubers do, right? So we're, we're very much focused on building our identity by, by, by curating our profiles. Mm-hmm. And that's like and, a new I, thing that, that just happened relatively recently, not just on the internet, as I said, in the academic system. I, I guess the scary thing there is, um, let's say, for example, I publish something where I make some statement, some, some moral statement for want of better language, and I get no views or I get 
lots of hate online, then, yeah. then maybe I shift, oh, you know, maybe I shift the way I actually think about that topic. Right. Maybe exactly. I will put my pronouns in my absolutely you know, Twitter. Yes. Or, yes. I see. So it's 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 yes. in some sense, absolutely. it's like it's more of a distributed uh, moral selection process or uh, yes, something like this. Very volatile. We don't know where we end up. It's um, yeah. Is you, you and I guess also it? online there are all different communities. So here's the different games, the different moral yes. games you can play as yes. well. Yes. Yes. And I, I guess then that spills out into the real world when you have elections or when you have to go to right. war with someone. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. It's going to be. It sounds like it's going to be like a moral battlefield rather than a moral paradise. <laughs> is the well, future. again, I mean, then you have like virtue signaling, right? That's that's what mm -hmm. we already see. That it becomes very important to be good at virtue signaling, mm -hmm. and it has to come across, and you have to be invested in it. That's also you have to develop, just like in the old days. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to be, you, you don't want to raise moral suspicion. You, you, just as in the old days, you should be really committed to your role, not just say it. Uh, so now you also, you have to virtue signal, but uh, you also don't want to be found out. You know, you have to, mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to do it well and you have to be convinced yourself in order to be able to convince others. Do you think we're going to have more or less of sort of the emperor's got no clothing <laughs> flips in morality? You know, because you can you can now interact with people uh, of your own persuasion uh, directly yeah. via the internet. On the other hand, uh, you have places like Twitter where people are really you know bullied out of the discussion. Do you, do you think we're heading into a place where um, there's going to be an underlying current that's more hidden uh, than in the past, even though we are more con connected? Or where where would you fall along? Uh, those lines. I think there is a possibility. I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're saying. That that we see more the that we that we have more how to say distrust in, to to mm -hmm. mor morality and moral appearances. And I think that would be a good mm -hmm. thing, right? That that moral that moral attitudes are uh, challenged much more. And uh, so, so not just by, diff that's the whole point, not just by different moral persuasions, but that we think that we see through the, the moral statement as a moral posture, that we don't take morality that seriously anymore. That's my whole point from the beginning. That's, that's I think, what we should. We shouldn't, we shouldn't take morality that serious. Shouldn't be so, so then, much then I, in awe of it. Then I can sort of see a path towards what you're saying, potentially, if I understand what you're saying now, which is, you know, people, are, just to pull your words, people are, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, pe people are virtue signaling. Yes. And this might destroy trust in someone's moral uh, yes. position if, if you see yes. through that uh, moral, yes. uh, you know, the, the exactly. virtual signaling. And, yes. and this may provide a route through which you um, lower the prestige of exactly. uh, moral statements in general. Exactly. And, okay, so, exactly. so, so the hope would be that you have like a, um, in some sense, you get driven into an, an amoral solution. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, That's exactly by the what, connectivity. I was, yeah. what I want, exactly the point I was trying to make, yes. I see. So I, I was going to try to finish up uh, by saying, you know, asking you what your dream of the future is. But I, it, it it seems like this is, it, do I have it right? That this is sort of the, the picture you want to drive? What, yes, what would you, yes. be your, um, I'll, I'll give you the last word on what, what's your dream for the yeah. future when it comes to society and uh, morality? Well, as I said, I hope that we can basically deflate morality as we already deflated religion. <laughs> well georg it's been an absolute pleasure i uh i, I like the image it's uh <laughs> I, I wonder if we're gonna have like a not, not a, like a new atheist movement but like a new anti-moralist movement or something like this yeah. it, it might happen that would be great yes <laughs> that would be great yes. well thank you very much for coming along thank you so much thank you so much Shane.